Good morning, City Light. My name is Patrick Chandler, and I do have the privilege of serving here as a student pastor. And so um, I uh, want to share with you a message this morning from Acts chapter 10 through 1118, entitled The Open Door of the Gospel. But before we get to our text this morning, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I grew up in North Mississippi and um, just outside of Memphis, Tennessee. And so uh, I feel like I'm right at home with this weather we are currently having. Um, it's nice and hot and very humid. Uh, I didn't know that, that was possible in Nebraska, but it is true. Um, so it's welcomed me in again this summer. But I've been married to my wife, Becca, for 10 years. And we have three little girls, uh, Emma, who is five, Karis, who is four, and Bree, who is three. You can see their picture is up there. And yes, my wife is that incredible. And yes, I am that crazy that we would have that many kids that quickly together. And so, um, but City Lights, when we moved here last summer, we began to hear a phrase called Nebraska Nice. I don't know if you're familiar with the term or not. Maybe you've never heard that. But as we were here, we kept hearing it. And then we began to experience Nebraska nice. As people opened up our, their homes for us to stay with them until our house was moving ready. As people uh, did all kinds of other nice things for us to care for us in the season of helping us move in, helping us paint our house, uh, even had someone come and cut our grass for us before our, before our lawnmower had arrived. And uh, some even invited us in for steak dinners, which is very much appreciated. We had someone who came to our house and cleaned out our gutters, which is a thankless job, but they had not been cleaned out in over five years. They were pretty bad. So uh, Nebraska Nice is a real thing, and you use Nebraska Nice to really welcome our family in and to make us feel like this was our new home. You opened the door to us to show care and love to us. And we thank you for that care that you showed towards us as we moved here from another state, literally halfway across the nation, uh, to be here in Omaha, Nebraska. So thank you again for showing us Nebraska nice. I'm a Southern boy who moved away from Southern hospitality, but you met me with Nebraska nice. So thank you again. But even though Nebraska nice is a real thing, church, if we are honest, we all have people in our lives that aren't so nice. And we think about that niceness not being there, us having a difficult time being nice to them. And we think of that in line with our Acts 1-8 mandate that we've seen in our Acts series of taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. It can be overwhelming. When you think about that really annoying Iowa fan who every year gives you a hard time about Nebraska football. Or you think about that half-hearted Nebraska fan who is only cares about Husker football and no other Nebraska sports. <laughs> Maybe they pull for Creighton. Or you think about those Wayne State guys who are so elitist to everyone else <laughs> that did not go to Wayne State like this man over here. Thanks, Rich. But no, seriously, we all have people in our lives that we encounter that aren't so nice or that are hard for us to care for. Let me give you a couple examples of these. What do you do when you encounter someone who doesn't look like you? Someone who maybe has tattoos or piercings. What about if you get introduced to a same-sex couple? What about when you run into a cross-dresser somewhere in town, maybe at a store? What about... When you have a conversation with someone who you feel like you have a lot in common with, but when you begin to talk about politics, you have a different political view than they have. What about your new neighbor who is not like you at all? Maybe they are Hindu, Muslim, or Buddhist. In each of these situations, we have an option to have an elitist mindset that our culture has or we can have a biblical mindset towards these people that we are encountering and, and knowing that the gospel knows no barriers. The gospel knows no barriers. Now, while we can't affirm many of these lifestyle choices or worldviews, we also cannot keep the gospel from going to these people. So how can we go from being just nice 
and to actually love all people and to show them that there is an open door of the gospel to them. Our passage teaches us today the gospel has been open up to everyone. So my big idea this morning is that since the door of the gospel has been open to everyone, the gospel came to you on the way to someone else. Again, because the gospel door has been open to anyone, the gospel came to you on the way to someone else. This is the longest narrative in the book of Acts, the longest story in the book of Acts. But I assure you this morning, no need to fret, it will not be the longest sermon in our Acts series. This narrative is long because of its importance. It shows us how the gospel door was open to anyone who would put their trust and faith in Jesus and not just for the Jews. When we think back about these people that we are trying to love and to share the gospel with and to share our lives with, it can be overwhelming. But we have to remember that God has given us a supernatural power to be able to even love the hardest of these. So in our time together this morning, we're going to see three realities from this text that shows us how the gospel can go from us to someone else. The first of these realities is that God prepares the heart of gospel hearers. God prepares the hearts of gospel hearers. The second reality is that God prepares the gospel proclaimer. And the last reality is that God shows no prejudice in spreading the gospel. We'll see these as we walk through this very long passage, seeing Cornelius's vision, Peter's vision, and the message that opened up the door of the gospel to all people. So let's jump into the passage and see our first reality that God prepares the heart of the hearers. Acts 10, verses 1 and 2. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all of his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. Again, our first reality is that God prepares the heart of gospel hearers. Here we see Cornelius is a man who um, God was preparing. He was a man who feared God, but he was not a Christian. He was religious, but he was not righteous. He didn't fit in the category with the Jews, and he didn't fit in the categories of the church. For the Jews, he didn't wear the right clothes or eat the right food or follow the right rules. But this was a Gentile man who was over part of the Roman army. Now, up until this time in the Bible, we see two different people groups. A little bit of backstory here, two different people groups. The first is that of the Gentile. A, a Gentile is one who is a non-Jew, who is an outsider with no open door to the gospel. The other group we see is the Jew. This is God's chosen race. They're recipients of God's promise. And it's likely that Cornelius never fit in either one of these categories. But we see God working in Cornelius' life and that he was a God-fearer, that he was one who prayed and God heard his prayer. And so I'm going to summarize for you verses 3 through 8 of chapter 10. We see that Cornelius was up and he was praying. And while he was praying, a visitor appeared before him. It says that when he saw the angel who came before him, a great terror fell on him. I think I would have a great terror on me also if I was praying and bam, a winged gospel beast popped up in front of me. I don't know if you've ever had that happen in your prayer life, but it hasn't happened in mine. The angel told Cornelius that God had heard his prayers and that he should send for Peter to come and to proclaim a message to him. So Cornelius sent men to go and to get Peter and to come back to his house. I'm reading this passage and I'm thinking, okay, I just had an encounter with an angel and he wants me to send, I'm a Jew, I mean, I'm a Gentile and he wants me to send for a Jew to come to my house. I think, hey, let's just cut the middleman out. Let's just have a conversation here. Why don't you just tell me, angel, what this message is I need to hear? Why wait two or three days? Let's just have this conversation right now. But that's not what Cornelius does. Cornelius quickly obeys God. And I think there's a model here for us, church, that when we see God speak, we should not delay our obedience either. 
Now, for those of us who are in Christ, we read this passage and we may think, hey, I am the insider going out to the outsider. But the reality is that we were all outsiders, that we were Gentiles. We were not the people of God. And the gospel door was open to us because of this passage that we are looking at today. Again, we are Gentiles. Thanks be to God that he has opened the door that allows anyone who would put their trust in Jesus to come in. I've seen this occur a few times as God prepared the hearts of people that would hear the gospel. But one in particular, a few years ago, I was on a mission trip in Toronto, Canada with a group of students. Now, originally we had planned to go to another city and not go to Toronto. But God redirected us there and we worked with a church planner who was brand new in the city. He hadn't even moved into his house yet. So we helped him move into his house and after doing so went and began to go house to house to tell people about the church plant and to tell them about the gospel. And as we went and did that and to tell them about what Jesus had done so they could have access in, the very first door we knocked on was a man who was a bull rider and a truck driver. Not what I had envisioned as the first Canadian convert, but nonetheless, we, we have this conversation with him, and as we do, a relationship has started with him and the church planner. Fast forward a few weeks down the road, and this church planner and him continue to have this conversation, and he trusts in Jesus. You see, God was working on his heart before we had planned to go to Canada, before the church planner had planned to go there, before we had even picked that, that neighborhood of where we were going. God was working in this man's heart to prepare him to hear the gospel that was on the way to him through us. The story doesn't end there. This man not only came to faith in Christ, but later God grew him to a place to where he ended up serving as a resident on staff at this church plant. God was in the work of preparing his heart. Now, I know some of you are here and you're like, I've never been on a mission trip or I'm not planning on going on a mission trip in the future. And I, I want to remind you of the mandate that we saw in Acts 1-8 as we began our time today, that we have the responsibility to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. So that means you should live on mission where you live, work, and play. To say that another way is that the gospel, as the gospel came to you on the way to someone else, Wherever your feet are is where your mission field is. So will you be faithful in that mission field? See, like, we don't have the ability to change anyone's heart. And we need to remember that God is preparing the hearts of those that will hear and receive the gospel. But God has the ability to, to break the hardest soil, to soften the hardest heart, that even the person that you think there's no way they would ever trust in Jesus, God has the ability to change that person's heart and bring them in because the gospel door has been open to anyone who would believe in Christ Jesus. So one practical application from this first reality is that you can begin to pray that God would give you, uh, give the people around you an understanding of their need for the gospel. They would understand that they are far from God, that they would understand that they um, do not measure up to God's standard and that they have a great need of the gospel. But not only does God prepare the hearts of gospel hearers, but secondly, we see that God prepares gospel proclaimers. In Acts 10, 9 and 10, it says, The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up to the housetop about the sixth hour to pray, and he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance. The next reality we see is that God prepares the gospel proclaimer. You see, God had been working in Peter's heart. Remember, Peter was a Jew, but God had been using Peter in a Gentile territory. The end of Acts chapter 9 ends with Peter doing two miracles, one healing a lame man and the other bringing someone back to life. He's crossing uh, ethnic boundaries. He is going, the gospel is beginning to tear down some of these walls that have stood for so long. But not only is that taking place, Peter is staying with, the, in a, with a man in a man's house who is a tanner of hides, which would have made this man unclean by Jewish tradition. But Peter not only doesn't see this man as unclean, he sees him as a co-laborer in the gospel and he's staying at his house. And it is while Peter is staying at his house, waiting on this meal to take place, 
that Peter is praying. Now, it may seem strange to pray like this in the middle of the day, but Peter was just following Jewish tradition and that a Jew would pray three different times throughout the day. And so as Peter is praying, he falls into a trance, he's hungry, the food is not ready, and he begins to see this sheet-like object falling from the sky, being lowered from its four corners, and inside of this is all, are all kinds of animals, reptiles, and birds of the air. This is a meat lover's dream. God tells Peter, take and eat. But instead, Peter says no. You see, as a meat lover, you have the opportunity to cook your meal, go maybe go hunt your meal, find it at the store, whatever, and put it together and prepare it. But not Peter. Peter is told, hey, eat. I've made all this clean. What I've made clean, let no man call unclean. No works required. Peter can eat and throw down on whatever he wants. But instead, he says, no. It may seem strange to us, but what's taking place is that there are food laws that have been in place for over 1,400 years that Peter is following... To, uh, falling custom of, and in doing so, he's doing that because it was God's way of keeping the nation of the Jews separate from the world around them, so they would be distinguished out. But Peter was the first Steph Curry, the king of the threes. You see, Peter denied Jesus three times. Peter was forgiven three times. But then we see in this vision that he is having that Peter sees this vision of this food being put before him three separate times. And at the end of every single one of these, God says to Peter, let no man call unclean what God has made clean. See, it seems like this is just about food, but actually God is preparing Peter's heart to take the gospel to the Gentiles, to have an open door of the gospel. City Light, it's because of this vision that you and I get to eat Omaha steak with a clean conscience. Unless you're a vegan, and to that I simply say, bless your heart. <laughs> While Peter was thinking about these things that had happened, he's perplexed. He's thinking about, I just saw this vision three different times, these different foods. It was, was, they were unclean, and now they're clean. In the midst of all of these considerations, the men who... Cornelius had sent to go get Peter, arrive at Peter's house. Before Peter knows they're there or that Cornelius has even had this vision, the Spirit comes to Peter and says, hey, I want you to go with some men who I'm sending to you. So Peter goes downstairs. Again, he is prepared. So he, Peter goes down and he meets these men and he asks them, why are you here? And they say, well, Cornelius a Gentile has sent for you a Jew to come and to share a message with him. So Peter, the next day, gets up and goes with these men back to Cornelius' house. And when they arrive at Cornelius' house, Peter asks, Why have you sent for me? And, P and Cornelius says, he tells him about this angel, this gospel winged beast that he's had this encounter with and that he was told that he would come and proclaim a message. But not only is, is Cornelius there at his house by himself, Cornelius, again, God has prepared the gospel here. Cornelius has gone and got all of his family and all of his friends and they're there ready to receive this message that will soon be shared by Peter. Let me illustrate for you a few years ago how God had to work in my heart as a gospel proclaimer. Went to Africa doing hut-to-hut -hut evangelism. As we went out, we had a translator who would share for us uh, in the language of the people we were doing ministry to. And while we were there doing ministry, the first one of the first huts that we went to, we come up and there is a seven-year-old boy overseeing a whole complex. And so the translator begins the dialogue with the seven-year-old and I'm thinking to myself, hey, let's just go on to the next house. Like, this is kind of weird. Like, what if this guy's dad comes back or if their family gets upset? Like, you know, if not, they, what if somebody takes something that's theirs? We're gonna get this guy in trouble. And so the translator starts talking to the, to the seven-year-old. He looks at me and he says, hey, we're going in. And I was like, okay. Um, God, I just pray we go in here fast and we would leave out here fast. <laughs> and as we went in, uh, the translator looked at me and says, Patrick, it doesn't matter what size the fish is. We're supposed to fish. I was like, okay, okay, God, I hear you. Like, okay, so, I, so still praying. Like, God, let's go quickly. And so we began sharing the gospel with this seven-year-old. 
And as we began sharing this gospel with this seven-year-old, my fear is realized. An older brother walks in, and the older brother comes in and he says, what I think he's going to say is, get out. But what he says is, hey, I really like what you were saying to my younger brother. Can you tell me, start over and begin telling me the same thing you were telling him? And so we did. Begin sharing the gospel again and walking through the story. And as we were walking through the story, my real fear happened. The father has come back. And I'm afraid in that moment, like, these two sons are going to be in great trouble. We're going to be in trouble. I just feel this awkwardness of the situation. And in the midst of all this, God is preparing my heart to be faithful to share the gospel message. But something uniquely strange happened in my mind in that the father said, hey, I liked what you were sharing with my sons. Would you start over and share with me as well? So we did, and as we finished sharing the gospel, we saw that entire household trust in Jesus. They all repented of their sins, and they all trusted Jesus, all because the size of the fish did not matter, and we would maybe never have reached. Yeah, you can clap for that. We would maybe have never reached the Father if it hadn't been through the Son, but my disbelief, God was preparing my heart. The story doesn't end there. As we're talking at the end of this uh, conversation of the gospel, we find out that this man, who is the father of the house, he is the chief over the entire region. And so here's a man of great influence that now the gospel has gone to in order to go to someone else. I thank God that he prepared my, the heart of the translator and, it was, and was preparing my heart for the gospel to go forward as the gospel came to me on the way to someone else. So how does God prepare our hearts to, for us to proclaim the gospel? A simple way for us to start for asking God to prepare our hearts to be able to proclaim with people that maybe we are around or people that, um, that maybe that uh, need to hear the gospel in our circle of influence where we live, work, and play would be to ask God to burden your heart for someone. Ask God to burden your heart for someone around you that you um, could share the gospel with. Maybe even right now as I'm speaking, you're envisioning that person that needs to hear and respond to the gospel. Who is your one? Secondly, we see that Peter exhibited a great obedience in being willing to go to Cornelius' house, even though he did not know why God was leading him there. How is this type of obedience possible? It's only possible through the obedience of Christ Jesus. And we'll see that in this last uh, reality as we see the message that literally opened the door of the gospel to anyone who would trust in Christ Jesus. Though Peter was an imperfect man, God changed his heart and moved his heart towards people he once discriminated against. We want our hearts to reflect what we see in our final reality, that God shows no prejudice in the spreading of the gospel. This message in 34 through 43 reveals our last reality, that God doesn't show any prejudice in spreading the gospel. Jesus has a heart to save all people, nation, tribes, and tongue. Earlier, Peter had asked Cornelius why he had come. And... and um, Cornelius tells Peter, you, I came so you could share this great message with me. And so as he begins to share this message that God had given him, the unthinkable thing happens. The Holy Spirit falls on these dirty Gentiles, these individuals that were outside of God's kingdom. These people represent us. We are the Gentiles again. But the gospel fell, uh, the, the Holy Spirit fell on them as they heard the gospel and received the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit the Jews had received back in Acts chapter 2 is now, are now being received by the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. So what did they hear that gave them an open door of the gospel let me give you a few highlights from our passage that was read so wonderfully before by our scripture reader. Acts 10, 34 and 35 say this. So Peter opened his mouth and said, truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Remember the Gentiles were outside. God gave them an open door by Jesus dying on the cross and raising him from the dead. If God's people had continued to show prejudice, don't miss this. 
If God's people, the Jewish people, had shown, continued to show prejudice, there would not be a single one of us in the room today because the gospel would not have come to us. The gospel would not have come to us because God's way of the gospel going forward is that it goes from one to someone else to someone else to someone else. So how did the the Jews get to the place to where they understood that God shows no prejudice? We see that in Acts chapter 11. In the beginning of Acts chapter 11, a group of individuals come to Peter and they say, what are you doing associating with this Gentile? What do you mean this Gentiles trusted Jesus and were baptized and received the Holy Spirit? And Peter says this in Acts chapter 11, verse 17. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? Notice what happens when he says this to these individuals. When they heard these things, they fell silent. And they glorified God saying, then to the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance that leads to life. See, church, I grew up outside of Memphis, Tennessee and North Mississippi and prejudice was something that was often around. It was in the news, it was, it was in schools, it was in family, it was all around. Prejudice was always present, often was public in, in different media outlets and things. And so when I come to a passage like this, I can't just assume that I have no prejudice. I have to ask the question, God, is there any prejudice in me that would stop me from taking the gospel that came to me to someone else? So I would encourage you, church, to ask that same question to yourself. Is there any prejudice in your heart that would be a stumbling block to the gospel going forward to someone else? Is that why you haven't shared the gospel with certain people in your life or your circle of influence? Church, there is no room for any prejudice in the believer's Life. We must kill that in our life and not allow our culture to drive us, but instead let our scripture drive us. So how can we do that? Well, we can do that because we see in this message that Peter proclaims to Cornelius and these people that are so eagerly waiting on the gospel is it's through Jesus. Jesus was obedient to God to the point of death and doing that, he rose, himself, he rose from the grave and in rising from the grave, we have forgiveness of sin. And so if God could come from heaven to earth, we can do you fill in the blank. Say that again. If, if, if he could come from heaven to earth, you can do fill in the blank especially in the area of killing prejudice in your life. Church, I'm afraid, though, that one problem that we have in our culture today in the church as well is that we have an impartial gospel or a gospel that has followed our culture and that we've muddied it down or we've watered down the gospel. And so I think in this passage, it gives us a clear presentation of what are some essential elements of the gospel. You see, there are people today that would say, uh, you can have Jesus, but you can have your sin, and that's not found in Scripture. It says that we should die to ourselves and follow Christ. And so uh, I have a slide for you that I'd just like for you to look at, that uh, not only in applying this third reality that God shows no prejudice in spreading the gospel, we need to make sure we eliminate prejudice in our life through God revealing that to us and us repenting of that. But we also need to make sure that we have a clear gospel understanding, and that leads to a clear gospel presentation. So there's a few things real quickly. Again, they'll be on the, on the, on the slide there. The first one is Jesus, the Messiah, is Lord of all. Jesus was empowered by the Spirit to liberate the devil's captives. Jesus died under the curse deserved by others. Jesus was raised up to reign forever. Jesus will judge everyone. And all of this is in accordance with the Scripture, which promised forgiveness for everyone, from every people who trust in Jesus' name. I don't know if you noticed this, but every single one of those are centered around Jesus. We have, if you're in Christ and you're in the room, you have been brought in. You're no longer an outsider, but you are an insider in God's kingdom. And that has happened through you understanding who Jesus is and what he's done for you. See, Christ came for all people groups. 
Those that are religious, but not regenerate. Those that are far from him, he draws near. Those that are like us and those that are different from us. Those of our ethnicity and all others that God created. We must be willing to lay aside all barriers or prejudices that we have in order for the gospel that came to you to go to someone else. As I wrap up our time here today, I want to encourage you that there's great hope in knowing that all the world has an open door to the gospel. For those that are here that are in Christ, you've already experienced all three of these realities as you became a believer. First, you experienced that God prepared your heart as a gospel hearer. Second, you experience that God used or prepared gospel proclaimers for you to hear from. And lastly, you were a Gentile who has been brought in. And, and in so doing, God shows you that he shows no prejudice in spreading the gospel. There are some of you, though, in this room today that maybe you find yourself outside God's family. You've not repented of your sins. You've not trusted in Jesus. You've not experienced the freeness and the forgiveness that God offers. If that's you here today, I would encourage you to repent of your sins and turn to God and know that God will meet you where you are and begin to transform you from the inside out. If you'd like to dialogue about that more, there'll be people in the back in a time of response in just a moment. Let me pray for us. Father, I pray the realities we saw in our text today would encourage someone in this room to repent of their sins and turn to you for salvation. Others that are here that are already forgiven and know you, I pray that they would take the keys that they have been given in the open door of the gospel and share it intentionally with those around them, maybe even the ones that you brought to mind earlier. Guard our hearts from any and all prejudice and let us love others as you have loved us. In your name we pray, amen.